This is the final of our Fero lecture series for the year. I'm always very sad and wistful when it's ending. Thanks for coming and being so kind to present to us. Um, so uh, today we have Dr. Crystal Colden, who is an associate professor at University of California at Merced. Crystal came to California, plus she has a history here, uh, most recently, three years ago, or when did you? Four years, Four years ago. She was for almost, how long were you? Nine or ten-ish years? Yeah, about ten years. I first, uh, you worked at the Washington office, in, but you did firefighting at the same time for a bit, and I think I knew you then, but then I think I met you when you were at DRI, because you were working on... It's like firefighting yeah, technology yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. I don't, okay. Anyway, that's when I think I first met you. Uh, and you did a master's at Reno. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. You worked at master's at Reno. She's been all over the place, obviously. And then your PhD at Clark University, I believe. Yes. And, hi. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, is that the screen talking to me? Um, and the other thing that I wanted to know oh, so at Merced, you're in an interesting department. It's called, oh, wait a minute, I think I remember it, <laughs> Management of Complex Systems. Yeah. Kind of interesting, um, part of the School of Engineering or something yes. like that. Tony Westerling, is he still the chair or was he the chair? Has he ever been the chair? He is the chair, yes. Okay, good. Very interesting um, uh, setup. A little bit like environmental science and policy in that there's a lot of people doing a lot of things and they're thinking the idea then was there'll be this amazing, you know, mixing current of sociology and economics. And really, in the end, everyone just works with the economists they know, and you know, in Japan and on China and they, instead of the people across the hallway. But that was a great idea anyway. <laughs> anyway, so thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, Crystal, maybe actually some of you probably met her at the fire science region last year. Actually, anyway, Crystal's going to talk about. Um, I'm, I'm really interested because there's going to be a big socio-ecological component in this. All right, it's all yours. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I and I, I uh, used to have my department on my opening slide, and then I got this fancy new title about a week ago, uh, where I'm now the director of the UC Merced Fire and Climate Center. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. it was an extra challenge for you to remember my. Uh, oh, good. I didn't get that one. Uh, department name. Um, so. I want to talk a little bit about uh, socioecological resilience today and start to connect how ecology can better inform sociological resilience to wildfire. Uh, because the question that everybody's asking, of course, is how on earth do we survive in this burning world where it feels like everything is on fire? Um, because, you know, unless you've been living under a rock in California or Greece or some of these other places, um, what we are seeing is these incredible wildfire events, not just in California, not just in US, but around the world, right? And that all of these photos are from just the last three years uh, where we have wildfires in suburban areas outside of London, uh, not a place we consider fire prone. Uh, and of course, uh, numerous uh, disastrous and fatal wildfires in Greece. Uh, the Dixie Fire uh, destroyed the town of Greenville in California three years ago. Um, and then the, the bottom right picture here is uh, from the Valparaiso area of Chile uh, from just a month and a half, two months ago almost, uh, where 133 people were killed. Um, so this is the type of scene that we are seeing more and more frequently. Um, and, you know, this is despite the fact that global area burn is actually declining. Uh, so Indel et al. put together this great data set a few years ago showing that, yeah, okay, global area burn is declining. And why is that? Well, most of our area burn globally is occurring in the African and Australian savanna, right, where we have massive amounts of agropastoral burning uh, that have been declining as land use changes uh, over the last couple of decades. Um, so driving an overall global decline if we only look at burned area. But when we start to look at the very limited amount of disaster data that is out there, what we see is that we're getting a lot more disasters. Uh, economically, this is data from an insurance firm that does global reinsurance, uh, where they are seeing an increasing uh, number of fires that produce economic, major economic losses um, and an increasing amount of those losses over time, right? And it's not just economics. People are dying in these things, right? And civilians specifically never really used to die all that much in wildfires, at least not in the last century or so. Uh, and what we're starting to see is this uptick in, again, not just the number of civilians that are dying, but the number of fires 
that are killing civilians, right? I mean, it's important to look at both of those because uh, some of these events have really high fatality rates, right? Like the recent fire in Lahaina uh, that killed 100 people. Um, and so, you know, as we start to ask ourselves, all right, well, how do we address these wildfire disasters? How do we start mitigating them? Um, it's, it's really a challenge. And one of the main reasons it's a challenge is because we just don't know a lot about the social side of wildfire disasters. We do know a lot about fire, but it is overwhelmingly disaster. Right? And when we looked at the paper I was involved in a couple of years ago, when we looked at just where the literature was at, the volume of literature on wildfires and bushfires, uh, the top 10 categories were all in the ecological biophysical realm. Right, None of the social science components uh, had a high enough volume of papers to get into the top 10. Um, and so we really don't have a lot of this social understanding that would help us get to this mitigation goal. Um, you know, and this is kind of because of the historical context of fire science, because the wildfire problem in 1871, well, yeah, a lot of people died in the Peshtigo fire, right? Um, and there was this massive fatality event, but that didn't really spark any massive changes in policy around wildfire in the US. And there were several more major fatality fires over the next five decades in the US uh, that you know, didn't really spawn any changes uh, except for 1910. Uh, and of course, this is the year of the big burn in uh, Northern Idaho and Montana, right? Three million acres, uh, 85 people died, mostly wildland firefighters that were plucked out of bars and jails and all sorts of interesting places. Um, but this fire marked a shift, right? It marked a shift in how the US treated fire and it also marked a shift in our willingness to start do start doing fire science uh, because well for a couple of reasons right uh, because first of all this fire burned up a lot of incredibly valuable timber um, and of course the timber barons that held all this timber and saw dollar signs basically going up in smoke said well this is not going to do and so that led to the second reason which is that they pushed congress to enact uh, the Weeks Act in 1911, and then later on things like the 10 a.m. policy, which facilitated this massive suppression effort, led to things like the Man Gulch Fire in 1949, and the loss of the firefighters in the Man Gulch Fire then leads us to establishing the Northern Forest Fire Research Lab uh, and the Forest Service embarking on this multi-decadal effort to understand fire behavior, and how we can better suppress fires, but really focused on forests, right? And the forests where people were dying, firefighters were dying specifically, right? And so that philosophy that it's really this wild land and forest focus funded by the Forest Service for our fire science has continued to impact the type of research we do today and the balance of that research, right? And uh, Dave Kalkin, the economist uh, up in Missoula and colleagues published this paper 10 years ago in PNAS that basically said, well, okay, if we wanna reduce home loss, right? From wildfires, 60% uh, of the equation, this framework to reduce structure loss is about the federal land management agencies managing their wildlands better, right? And the idea is that it's this sort of donut effect, right? We gotta keep the fires from getting from the wildlands into the wooey where the structures are at, right? And there's a little bit of stuff here about, yeah, home, home uh, hardening has to happen a little bit, right? Developers need to pay a little bit more attention, but it's really about how federal agencies manage the wildlands. Right. Um, and you'll notice at the top of the pile here, the focus is on reducing the risk of home loss. There's nothing in here about fatalities. Why not? Because we really hadn't had very many. Um, and they've updated this so that 10 years later, they published this paper, uh, Dave Calvin and other colleagues published this paper uh, late last year saying, well, OK, yeah, right. We've changed our philosophy a little bit. But what we want to point out is that when these fires get into the WUI, it's not a wildfire anymore. It's an urban conflagration, right? And there's still in this new framework, 
this emphasis on structures and how structures are fuel, how they're flammable, right? And the paper's about, okay, well, if we're gonna stop urban conflagrations, conflagrations, we have to look at all of this structural stuff, right? So we've shifted from, it's all about the wildlands to, well, right, okay, we've gotta, we gotta deal with these structures so we don't lose as many homes. Um, and, you know, again, not really talking about fatalities at all. Um, part of the reason that they haven't talked about fatalities is because there's no data set on fatalities. The U.S. does not record civilian uh, wildfire fatalities. They record firefighter fatalities. The National Fire Protection Association records that. But uh, until I did this over the course of this last six months, nobody had a civilian wildfire fatality data set. So I put it together. Um, and... It's not perfect, uh, it's not published yet, we're working on it. Uh, but what we are showing is that there is this increase in the number of civilians dying in wildfires. And more importantly, again, because these are episodic events, that there is an increase in the number of fatal wildfires that kill at least one person. There's almost no research on this. So if we are trying to mitigate the effects of wildfire so that we don't have these wildfire disasters to our social infrastructure, right? To our communities. How do we do this? We don't understand the dynamics. We're just barely starting to scratch the surface socially. So what I've been thinking about a lot the last few years is that I started my career much more on the biophysical side, the ecology side. That's all I did for a long time. Um, and as I have moved over more into understanding the social, what I've realized is that there are a lot of lessons that we can take from what we already know about fires and ecological systems that fires impact. And we can transfer some of those lessons to social systems and how we mitigate fire disasters into social systems. So I want to share five examples to challenge you to think about a lot of people in this room, potentially a lot of people on, online, are people who really work mostly in the ecological realm, right? They're working in forests, they're working in the biophysical aspects of fire. Uh, and for all of you that are thinking to yourselves, well, I'm not a social scientist, you know, that's, that's another arena. What I would say is there are a lot of things that we can actually translate. Um, and it is not something that you may have thought about before, but hopefully after this, you'll start to think, uh, what are the ways in which my work can translate? Okay, so the first example, this is an easy one. There's an enormous amount of literature about the fact that we cannot prevent all wildfires, right? Standard knowledge. This is figured out by biophysical sciences years ago. We can't prevent all these fires. The number one reason we can't prevent all these fires is, well, uh, we can't control lightning, right? I, nobody's got a phone line to Zeus, right? So we're not gonna be able to stop the lightning emissions. Um, and those lightning emissions make up a fair portion of the number of wildfires. They make up an even bigger portion of the burned area right, from those wildfires. So we're not gonna prevent those, right? And that's something we can all pretty easily agree on uh, from the biophysical literature. So how do we start to translate that? Well, we can't prevent all wildfires and we definitely can't prevent lightning emissions, but there's a lot of human emissions too. Can we prevent some of those human emissions? Right now, the way that we're approaching this is we're trying to prevent all human emissions. That doesn't work either, right? We've really reduced the number of human emissions, um, but it's not working so great. Um, and so if we agree that Ecology has taught us that we cannot prevent all emissions. Then can we ask, okay, which ones are the most preventable? Um, and so we start to look at which ignitions turn into fires that matter. Uh, and the types of fires that matter, of course, are the ones that burn down structures and the ones that kill people. Um, and so we published this paper last year uh, about specifically downslope wind fires. 
uh, because those are the fires that move really, really fast, um, and they are highly prevalent in California. And one of the things that we looked at was, all right, well, what proportion of these downslope wind fires uh, are what proportion of structure loss and fatalities are associated with downslope wind fires, right? And how much more likely is a downslope wind fire uh, to take out structures, kill people, right? Um, and downslope wind fires, you know, I'm saying this word pretending like you all know what I'm talking about. Um, if you have no clue what I'm talking about, scientifically, the atmospheric scientists say it's a catabatic wind fire, right? It's a fire that moves up and over a mountain range, and then as it comes down the other side, it uh, the pressure increases, it increases in speed, and it gets really hot. Uh, in California, we have a lot of names for these colloquially, right? Santa Ana's, Diablo winds, Jarbo winds, right? All of these really strong east or northeast wind fires that we see in the autumn in California. And it turns out that those fires do an enormous quantity of damage, right? They burn a lot more structures, they kill a lot more people, right? And a fire that uh, is started or is started during a downslope wind or is driven by a downslope wind, right, has a much higher proportion or a much higher likelihood uh, of taking out structures or killing people. Okay. So, right, downslope wind fires, those are really bad. They're also incredibly difficult to suppress. So we really want to try and prevent these fires because they are really impossible to suppress, right? When the wind's blowing 60, 70 miles an hour, there's no aircraft support. Okay, so what starts these downslope wind fires? Well, there's a lot of different things that start downslope wind fires. So let's think about which of those ignition types we can actually mitigate, right? Some of them we can't, we can't. arson, we're not gonna mitigate that, right? People are gonna go out and do really stupid stuff um, on purpose, right? They're trying to start fires. Uh, a lot of the types of fires, equipment, debris fires, right? These are things where people are sort of making chaos type decisions. Uh, it's a chaotic system, right? And we can't really deal with those as easily as the types of ignitions that are already regulated or could easily be regulated, right? So things like fireworks, these are already regulated, um, not very effectively, right, in a lot of places. It is really interesting uh, to go to other countries and see how they treat personal fireworks very, very differently than we do. Uh, energy, how many fires have you heard about in the last few years that were started by power lines, right? The energy industry is heavily, heavily regulated. And we know that when we change our energy infrastructure, that we change ignition rates. How do we know? Because after 2003 and 2007, San Diego Gas and Electric said, uh, yeah, we really got nailed by those big fires that we started. And so they started undergrounding a lot of their most uh, critical power lines, right? Places places where they had a lot of fuel, places where there was a high potential for a fire to blow up and be difficult to suppress. So they started undergrounding that stuff. San Diego has been very successful at not having another major fire, despite the fact that they get massive Santa Ana winds uh, almost every year, right? And they've had several opportunities to have big fires in the last uh, 17 years and they've not really had one, right? So that's something that's, that's regulated. PG&E could do this in Northern California, right? Regulatory funding willpower, right? Um, and it hasn't <laughs> happened yet, but we have the framework in place to do so. Railroads, heavily, heavily regulated, right? Uh, this is an industry that, I mean, they're in straight lines. It's not like things go off the tracks to far flung places, right? So again, places where small amounts of effort uh, could potentially result in a drop in emissions. Um, and then recreation. This is the type of thing that education campaigns actually are very effective for reducing recreational emissions. Uh, and we don't put a lot of money and effort into that, right? We don't do the types of things that would reduce uh, recreational emissions. Um, you know, and I will note that uh, Part of the reason that the percent of burned area is so high on recreation is because there were two major fires uh, in California in the last 20 years that were started by hunters in the fall associated with Santa Ana conditions, right? Massive fires. 
So, you know, doing the types of things to educate the public about how they can modify their behavior so that they are less likely to start a disastrous welfare, because most of the people who are out recreating, they're pretty smart people anyway, right? They go out and do a lot of things in the wild. They have an appreciation. They don't want to see the places they love burn down. So just improving that. Okay. Second example, how we can translate ecological and biophysical lessons to mitigating uh, social welfare disasters. One of the things that we figured out, thanks to uh, decades of uh, fire and ecology work, is that species have very differential adaptations to fires. We know that species are very differentially adapted to fire, right? Um, and we published this paper uh, in 2018, around the same time uh, Yuli Pausis uh, also published a paper to the same type of um, idea where we have these different classes of species adaptation to fire, right? We've got species that are highly sensitive to fire. If fire touches them, they die, right? Roll over, don't just play dead, be dead, right? Uh, we've got species that are avoiders. They put all of their resources and their, oh, okay. <laughs> all right, now we've hopefully got some Okay, uh, they've got all of their reproductive resources stored underground, right, when the fire comes. Uh, they put all their non-structural carbohydrates down into their root systems, the fire comes, and then they just regrow afterwards. No worries, right, Resprout. Uh, we've got species that are highly fire adapted. We have lots of these in California, right? They do things like drop their lower limbs, uh, grow really thick bark on the outside, no worries, right? Um, and when fire comes, preferably low severity fire, they survive. Uh, and then we've got species that are fire dependent, right? They actually are just waiting for that wildfire to come. And in fact, they you know, mostly grow in such a way that they, when the fire starts, they are going to go fully stand replacing, right? Uh, this is our lodgepole line. We have our lodgepole pine. There we go. We have this in California. Uh, of course, most notably, the major lodgepole pine stands that do the full stand replacing show are around places like Yellowstone, the Northern Rockies, right? They kill everything else around them, and then they immediately seed and start growing again. So they maintain their monopoly on a landscape, right? So do we have... All right, first all right. Uh, so, right, we know what these things are, right? This is, this is, the ecologists are like, yeah, of course, we've seen this a thousand times. We teach this in undergrad classes, right? Uh, giant sequoia, easily our most famous fire adapted, mostly resilient to fire tree, uh, right? Our California oaks, fire avoiders, right? By the time fire is rolling around in late summer, early fall, they have done, they're done growing their leaves for the year. Uh, they have put all of their resources into uh, the, the root systems, right? And fire comes along. This is, um, this is about two weeks after the Creek fire um, in fall of 2020, there has been no rain, okay? And this oak was like, I'm good, goes gangbusters, right? Starts re-sprouting because it's so adapted using this avoidance strategy, right? And then we have our higher, uh, fire sensitive species. Um, and I always like using this one for fire sensitive even though it's not from California uh, because Tasmania has all these fantastic paleo endemic species that are not adapted to fire. They have not evolved with it. And as they've had increasing wildfires in Tasmania over the last uh, decade or two, they are really worried about losing their paleo endemics because with these guys, with some of the other species, uh, as soon as fire touches it, they just shrivel up and die, right? And they're gone. They'll never get them back again. Okay, so we have these different adaptations and we develop strategies to help support these different species, right? So giant sequoias are pretty adapted. They're also incredibly important to us and we have forest management issues. So what do we do? Well, in places like Yosemite and giant sequoia, we just wrap the things in foil and scrape all the needles away, right? We help them by amplifying their innate adaptation. 
right? Uh, and places like the deserts, it was fire in Mojave last year, and they went in ahead and said, okay, we're going to get all these burrowing owls out there. Uh, these, you know, these guys are about yay high, and they live in these little burrows all over the desert, um, and they're protected. So they're like, all right, we're going to go in and evacuate these things. This is what BLM was doing ahead of this fire coming in last night, was evacuating burrowing owls, right? Because they're fire sensitive, because if that fire touches them, they're going to die. Right? They are fire sensitive species. Um, and the thing is, humans also have different fire sensitivities. Okay, when we look at who is dying in these wildfires in this civilian fatality data set, we don't have a lot of demographics um, because of privacy issues uh, and because a lot of the data are really old. But one of the things we see is that, like with many natural hazards, older people have a higher probability of dying, right? Uh, there are all kinds of mobility limitations. Uh, many of them don't drive anymore, um, or they just have all kinds of um, you know, challenges trying to evacuate from fires. And so overwhelmingly, uh, we have seen that older people are much more susceptible to dying in uh, wildfires in the US at least, right? Um, even though they're a much smaller portion of the US population, okay? And it's not just people who are older. Uh, when we look at uh, how fatal wildfires play out across different census tracts, um, one of the things that we see, and this is uh, some work that one of my grad students just defended in a thesis, um, one of the things that we see is that in places where there are fatal wildfires, we looked at those census tract data and you know most of these things were pretty similar to the state average, but uh, census tracts within fatal wildfires are older than the state average, and census tracts within fatal wildfire perimeters um, are also more impoverished than the state average. Right, so older, poorer people dying more frequently uh, than the uh, the. For in fatal wildfires, right? Um, interestingly, one of the things we looked at was citizenship and linguistic isolation, right? These are not people who are overwhelmingly not people who are uh, immigrants or are linguistically isolated, right? So they don't speak English. Um, there are absolutely immigrant fatalities in the data set, right? But the types of census tracts where these fatal wildfires are occurring, right? They're mostly in census tracts in rural areas that are dominated by older white people who have oftentimes moved there because they're on fixed incomes, right? They can't, they got priced out of the valley, so they move into these rural towns. Um, and that is uh, ending up being a problem for them when fires happen. Okay. All right. So those are the people that are more sensitive to fatal wildfires, to dying in a wildfire, right? What is the action that we can take to support? We do this for ecology. We take different types of actions for people, right? So how do we take different actions for our different social vulnerabilities, right? So uh, we can develop programs. This is from uh, Montecito, uh, which of course is famous as the place where Harry and Meghan and Oprah live. Um, and it's a really rich community, but they also have a very large elderly population. And so the Montecito Fire Protection District developed a set of programs that were specifically designed to support the most vulnerable people within that community, um, including things like, you know, this lady is not going to get out there with a chainsaw and clear defensible space around her house. Right. So they developed these programs to bring in uh, crews for that are working with the community uh, to help clear a lot of defensible space, right? They developed evacuation plans for all of their senior citizens to make sure that everybody had a way to get out. Um, similarly, we have evacuation challenges when we're talking about the unsheltered population, right? The unhoused and unsheltered population. Um, there are a lot of these people in California that just keeps going up because every time we have a fire, we lose a lot of housing. Um, and so uh, one of the things that's been a challenge the last few years for communities is figuring out how do we evacuate the unhoused population. Um, and actually Tahoe did this really, really well during the Caldera fire. Uh, the regional transit agency and the regional um, homeless agency uh, worked together to 
find and evacuate all of the uh, unsheltered or unhoused population and do it in a way that was not sort of, um, they basically worked with people's needs, right? People who have nothing need to bring everything with them. So they work with those needs, okay? The third lesson is that we have a really high diversity in uh, resilient ecosystems, right? So we've done a lot of work on fire regimes and understanding the diversity across fire regimes, enormous variability, enormous diversity, right? And so we end up with maps like this, where we've got, okay, in this place, there's predominantly, historically, there was predominantly low severity fire at a high frequency, or there was predominantly stand replacing fire at a much lower frequency, right? So we recognize that in these ecosystems, there's this enormous diversity, right? And that we have to manage these landscapes differently depending on that fire regime, right? Our solutions are different based on fire regime diversity. Um, we're not doing that for social systems yet, and we should be. Uh, for example, right, we know that in frequent low severity fire regimes, right, our prescription for how we manage these regimes is, well, okay, we need to remove a lot of that density that has built up over a century of fire suppression, and then we need to add prescribed fire back in, right? And we need to return that frequent low severity fire to facilitate forest health, right? Uh, for a place that is predominantly an infrequent stand replacing regime, right? Our management strategy is, well, it's gonna burn. We can't stop it. So we're gonna go ahead and let it burn, right? And we have managed wildfire programs uh, in almost every part, in almost every national park in the Western US, right? That help to facilitate this management strategy. Uh, which, you know, has actually been borne out over the years. People absolutely freaked out after the 88 Yellowstone fires, but it's grown back exactly like it evolved to, right? So we've got this diversity of solutions for ecological systems. When we look at social systems, we do not have that diversity of strategies because the prescription for people living in the McMansion in the Wooey on five acres and people who are living in a mobile home park in the Wui is the exact same. That's the message we give. Oh, just dispensable space, right? Five foot zone, nothing flammable, 30 foot zone, clear the small stuff, right? Maybe have some green grass, a uh, hundred foot zone, right? Trim back your big trees, reduce your ladder fuels. That's our prescription. And that is the prescription that we've been very, very good at giving out for years. We also, really focus on it being the homeowner's responsibility to do this work, right? Uh, that does not recognize the social diversity of who lives in the WOOC, right? Um, and that lack of recognition is what causes us to have the types of disastrous impacts that we're seeing. So an example of how this diversity plays out uh, comes from these two fires in 2022. They're pretty small, right? 2022, we had the coastal fire down in Laguna Niguel. This is a very wealthy area, right? Uh, only a 200 acre fire. It came up a canyon, burned everybody on the edge. These were all, these were McMansions. These were bigger than McMansions. Um, and 20 homes were destroyed, right? And you can do the math to figure out how much those homes were worth. Uh, but, you know, most of these are either already rebuilt in the process of rebuilding. These people have the resources. They had good insurance, right? They have a lot of them have second homes. They had the resources to be resilient and recover quickly. By contrast, the 2021 cash fire in uh, Clear Lake, okay, up in Lake County, uh, in, in that fire, it was a pretty small fire, right? Again, it was, I think that fire was less than 10 acres. Um, but what it burned was this 60 unit mobile home park that was a 55 plus senior mobile home park for people on fixed incomes. This is a very poor county. Okay, and in that location, nobody has built back, right? And when you go to places like this, mobile home parks, which are, and they're not just tornado magnets, they are also wildfire magnets, right? And we say, well, yeah, just clear your defensible space. Um, in case you're not familiar with how mobile home parks work, 
You own the structure, you do not own the land it sits on, right? And your neighbor is 10 or 15 feet away from you. You can't do things like defensible space in those mobile home parks, right? So we're not recognizing this diversity be, and we're not recognizing that not all Louis is created equal, right? There is a disproportionate occurrence of fire disasters uh, in when we look globally at disaster data sets, right? Uh, really disproportionately in two key biomes, Mediterranean biome and the temperate conifer biome, right? Uh, so Mediterranean, we're actually both these biomes we're very familiar with because we have a lot of it in California. Right? But that is where the vast majority of our fatal fire events and our disastrous fires, economic disaster fires, have occurred over the last uh, 40 years. And when we look at not just a big giant global biome, but we look at California uh, ecoregions or ecotypes, right? One of the things that we see is, again, we have certain vegetation types that are not very many people live there, right? Relative to the larger California population, but those vegetation types produce an outsized proportion of fatalities and fatal wildfires. Um, and you know, the, the one that I personally always love the best uh, is this Cal, I realize you can't read this, California, lower montane, blue oak, foothill pine, woodland, and savanna. Say that 10 times fast, okay? What is that thing describing? You go over, okay, I'm totally turned around on this campus. That's north, right. So you start to go up into the foothills anywhere along the Sierra Nevada or on the coast range, right? And it's between about 1,000 and 3,000 feet. It is the place where the pines come down, the oaks are hanging out, the grasslands are still coming up, and there's a lot of manzanita and shot out there, right? Incredibly heavy fuel loads that used to be reduced by a lot of indigenous burning. Right? And now that's where all the houses are sitting. We've got that in this sort of narrow bathtub ring around the Central Valley and on the west side of the coast range. Um, and it is producing this incredibly outsized uh, impact with wildfire disasters, right? Similarly, uh, we have Southern California oak woodland in Savannah, right? Anytime I see woodland in Savannah, I'm like, right, a lot of oak trees used to be all grass between them. Now without fire for 50 or 100 years, it's all chaparral in between them, right? Places that carry fire and make it really, really difficult to adequately defend communities. Okay, so if we were actually going to acknowledge this social diversity, what would that look like, right? What might we do? So uh, we, we can still tell the McMansion owners, look, do your defensible space, right? You built this ginormous thing because they can do that, right? Um, but what do we do for something like a mobile home park, right? We're we just gonna close all mobile home parks in Louise? We don't have to, we can come up with alternative solutions using what we know from ecology and forest and fuels management, right? We can look at mobile home parks as an entire unit and actually remove a lot of the fuels and buffer zones around the entire mobile home park and create refugia areas where people can get to who don't have a car, right? Uh, and create escape routes that are well protected in the event of, of fire. Um, and I want to recognize that this is some really great work being done by uh, a master's student at UC Berkeley, Harry Ray. Uh, and, you know, this is not just theoretical. This is happening, okay? Marin County is the most expensive county in the state housing-wise. The city of Novato has this mobile home park. Mm -hmm. uh, it's over 300 units. It's all 55 plus fixed income people, right? Um, and they, every single year, this is a predominantly grass and shrub biome, right? So what's the appropriate uh, type of fuels management to do here? They bring in a giant herd of goats every year that eats all the new growth around and in the park, right? And so they maintain this buffer and this low fuel area, uh, not only in the mobile home park, but along the evac route, right? Uh, that significantly reduces the danger to that park for that population, okay? Um, you know, and we published a paper a couple of years ago that says like, yeah, we really need to diversify, not just the way we look at managing fire and biophysical systems, but also in social systems. Um, okay, lesson four, biomimicry, right? Everybody knows about biomimicry. We all had Velcro shoes as little kids, right? 
Uh, so what are the analogs of natural fire resistance? Where can we look to try and copy that? Um, there are fire refugia everywhere. I worked on fire refugia for a lot of years. Uh, and, you know, sometimes they're random. The wind shifted, something happened. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes there are places like where beavers have built a dam and produced an inundation area that stays nice and wet. The soil is always moist enough that you don't have fire happening there. Um, right? So we've got these examples all over ecology. The thing is, we also have fire refugia in our wooey areas. We just haven't recognized them yet. Um, so this is Lahaina two days after the fire. Um, and, you know, destruction, 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 destruction. Uh, here's where all the cars backed up into each other and people were jumping into the sea. Um, and I looked at this satellite image and thought, right, I know there's some refugia in here somewhere. Um, and it turns out there are, right? Anybody want to guess what these are? One of them is a parking lot, right? It's a giant parking lot. None of these trees got burned, right? They're just, they're far enough apart. Oh, shocker, trees that are far enough apart won't burn, right? And yeah, the pavement was probably very smoky and unpleasant, but if you sat there, you wouldn't have died. Um, the other spot, that's a cemetery. Cemeteries are maintained. They're often watered, so the grass stays green and the grass is then mowed and kept very, very short so people can respect, pay respect to the loved ones. Um, I don't know how many people ran past the cemetery and I hope that nobody that ran past it ended up getting caught by the fire because it would have been such an easy place to take shelter and live. Now, we don't think about stuff like that, right? Uh, finally, fifth lesson. Fuel management must be active and ongoing. Uh, he was talking earlier at lunch about how much work he does every single year uh, on his place up in the mountains, right? To try and make sure that he maintains his defensible space and that his house doesn't burn down the next time a caliber fire comes right raising over the hill, racing over the hill, right? Um, and we know that fuels management has to be active and ongoing from all of our work in forest ecology, right? Forest service, you can't just do the treatment once. You got to come back and keep managing it because guess what? Vegetation regrows. Well, that's true in social systems as well, in the Wui, in socio-ecological systems. We have to keep up the maintenance, right? Um, these are two different pictures of abandoned agro-pastoral landscapes, right? A vineyard in France. Uh, this is a picture I took in Chile last year after their fires and an orchard, right, really high fuel loads. And in fact, that orchard is just a couple of miles from where one of the fires burned uh, two months ago in Chile, right? These landscapes have been abandoned and they are contributing to major wildfire behavior uh, in Europe, in South America, right, and here in the US. And it was one of the contributing factors in Lahaina, right? Agropastoral land abandonment. We can't just set it and forget it, right? We have to keep doing it. So how do we do this? What's the prescription for socio-ecological systems with continuing to maintain this stuff? Part of it is we have to train more people, right? We have to educate, we have to train more people that aren't just gonna go up to the faraway forest and do fuels management year after year after year, but are doing it in and around our communities, right? Um, I'm really fortunate to work with uh, these four uh, Mono tribes down in Fresno County uh, that formed the Sierra Sequoia Burn Cooperative uh, several years ago, and they've been doing a lot of fuels reduction on their land. And it's not just about restoring cultural burning. It's not just about doing fuel reduction. It's also about training the next generation and passing on that knowledge to new land stewards, right? Um, and then, you know, I got to practice what I preach, right? Um, I used to live up in Sonora on five acres. Uh, and this is, he was then seven. This is my seven-year-old and, and the dog tending a burn pile, right? Training the next generation. Kids love fire. Let's make sure that they respect it, right? Okay. So I hope I've convinced you that ecology tells us a lot that we can then translate and apply to how we manage socio-ecological systems for fire. And I hope that if you were somebody who works in ecology, you might start thinking to yourself, oh, okay, how could my work translate outside of that faraway wildland forest 
and potentially also apply to our WUI and our sociological systems, right? Because we've got all these examples of how we're already doing it and all these strategies that we know will work. We just have to shift them slightly, pivot them. And with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. I'm interested in the, uh, the biomimicry part of what you're talking about. And uh, wh where have you seen that being actively um, implemented on the ground? Um, so, so the reason that I, and specifically the fire refugia piece, um, the reason I started thinking about uh, how what I understood about fire refugia could be applied to identifying potentially safe locations was actually when I was in Australia, uh, because uh, I was I spent a sabbatical in Tasmania several years ago, um, and one of the things I noticed right away, Tasmania happened to have its second largest fire season ever. While I was there, I didn't do it. I swear, um, I've been asked that many times. <laughs> uh, the the thing about the Australians was that every little community right? Uh, whether it was a few houses, a few hundred people, all the way up to the city of Hobart, the capital. Every community has a little fire plan, right? It's, it's one or two pages, um, and it's basically, here's what you do in the event of a fire. And I started looking at these maps, and I saw this little thing on there uh, called a nearby safer place. And I thought to myself, what the heck is that? And I noticed as I went into Google Maps, um, because I'm a geographer and I get curious about stuff like this, was that the nearby safer places were almost always the same types of places. It was a cricket pitch, right? It was the football stadium. It was the field at the school where all the kids played. Or on rare occasions, um, it was something like a large cemetery that just had a huge green area, right? And the idea with that a lot of these towns are, you know, it's one way in, one way out, right? They have horrible ingress, egress problems. Um, and they basically said, well, okay, if the road gets cut off, which happens all the time in Australian fires, where are people gonna go so that they can survive? It might be terrifying. In fact, it will be terrifying, right? They're gonna breathe smoke. They need to get down low to the ground, um, but they'll live. Uh, and they did this in the aftermath of the Black Saturday fires in uh, 2009, I think, 2008, I can't remember now. Um, so, you know, they, they've got these places pre-identified on maps, people in the community know where they are and they can get to them if the evacuate cuts out. And I thought, oh yeah, those are all refugee. Oh yeah, you know, we have green spaces in every town in America. I used to live, I didn't even live in Sonor. I lived in some dinky little town uh, further up the road in uh, Tuolumne City. And, you know, we've got the elementary school and they have a big green grass playground that they water all year long, right? And that town is very likely to get cut off. And I always thought, okay, yeah, if we're down in town and a fire starts and it's moving fast coming out of the Tuolumne River Canyon, we're gonna go sit on that green grass. Right? I'm not going to risk going down this road because a lot of people die on roads in evacuations. Right, There's really dense vegetation. Um, so then I started thinking about it in the context of, well, yeah, these things are just like all these fire refugia that I used to study on the ecological. Um, and what are the other types of biomimicry that we can actually look at? Golf courses are a classic one. Golf courses. So, okay, they, 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 and most of them, I think, are in place. I don't know how many new golf courses are going in, but yeah. it's a great example of where you got really lucky if you happened to be in a place that was in one of those you know neighborhoods, expensive ones, surrounded by a big golf course because there's no home loss in those places. I have um, a couple of pictures uh, also from Google Earth of right after the um, Tubbs fire went across Santa Rosa in 2017, right? And that that's a a lot of the places that got hit there were much wealthier places, right? So yeah, they're golf course communities. Um, and it was really fascinating looking at, okay, here's all these houses that burned down and then right next to the golf course, a lot more of the houses survived. I also know that a lot of the people that were trying to get out of those neighborhoods um, were some of the people who really struggled to get out because roads got blocked and things happened, right? And I thought, oh, they should have just driven on the golf course. They would have been fun. But we don't think like that. We don't talk about that in our community welfare protection um, and it's, you know, I do a lot of work on CWPPs and we've been trying to insert that. People are like, no, 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 we don't want to, we don't want to be responsible 
for identifying potential places where people might then die. I'm like, they're not going to die. It's a green bubble, of course. But I want to identify places where people might die. Yeah. I, I have, uh, yeah, there's been some discussions about finding funding for this, and I can't get any bites yet because that's how everybody thinks in our litigious society. But no, we don't want to, we don't want to identify places because what if somebody tries to get there and we don't make it, right? We want everybody to evacuate. I'm like, it isn't working so hot anymore. Okay. So, Hannah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I was curious. I like that. The, it's really cool. The, um, slides we had about the different types of vegetation where different types of fires occur and like the more damaging and the more disaster fires are from yeah. that. And I was just curious if you could talk a little more about that and like um, to what extent it's about the fuel and the fire behavior in those versus just where people happen to live. Or... Yeah, so this is one of our, uh, you know, one of our next steps in uh, now that we have a data set, right, and trying to actually build models to tease out yeah. some of the predictors, right? Because obviously it's really complex, um, you know, and we can say, oh, well, these places are really flammable. I mean, that's that's what CAL FIRE has to do, right? CAL FIRE's got this fire hazard map and they're like, all these places are really hazardous because fire happens there a lot. Um, and, you know, and that is what they are mandated to do. But I always think as a scientist, okay, can I explore that and try and get some of the nuance, right? Because we know that downslope winds are a problem. We have not yet uh, overlaid downslope winds on hazardous fuels across the state to say, all right, yes, there's a lot of high fire hazard, but these are all the places where downslope winds happen with pretty high frequency, right? Yeah. Um, because those are the places that really are going to be in trouble. Right. Those are the places where you're not going to have time to evacuate. Those are the places where you're going to lose air support when you try and do suppression. Uh, because when you have a wind driven fire at 60, 70 miles an hour, there's no air support. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so thinking about that component, thinking about the transit infrastructure, right? That's another predictor variable that fits into that. Um, you know, and, and even across, I, I was having a conversation with somebody. Uh, during the student defense a week and a half ago, we were like, oh, why haven't we, why haven't we taken the wooey and parsed it out and said, well, yeah, okay, this is wooey that is, um, it, you know, it's wooey according to the federal standard or federal register definition, right? If you don't all know the reason it, with the definition for wooey is defined in the federal register, and that's the definition that uh, the Silvis Lab uses to create the data set, right? Um, so you can go look it up. Uh, and I always think to myself, okay, well, right, that just tells us that there's some wooey there, but it doesn't tell us, is this wooey that is all full of hundred year old houses? Is this wooey that is all brand new housing that are built to the 7A building codes, right? That have potentially lower flame. Those houses have been hardened, right? Um, what are the different, is this wooey that is two seconds away from uh, a you know a Cal Fire fire station, a tanker base. I lived in Sonora. We had a tanker base right outside of Sonora, which meant that anything and uh, that started in the county close by, the tankers run fast, um, and they don't have downslope winds there. So most of those things got caught pretty quick. Um, you know, in other places, you know, there's fire stations on some of those back roads, hour away, two hours away, right? The uh, problem is not that we can't detect these fires fast enough. The problem is that it takes too long once we've detected them for suppression resources. Uh, so when you're really far away from a fire station, you have a much higher likelihood that in that lag period, the fire is going to grow dramatically, right? We don't map those things onto the ecosystems that they're sitting in to say, all right, where are the places that stuff's going to go bad fast? versus the places we might have a little bit of time. Right? And we were talking this morning that, you know, Paradise, um, when it burned down at the campfire, they had an excellent evacuation plan. Uh, they could have evacuated the whole town in four hours. They didn't have that long. They had just drilled that evacuation plan a few months before. They simply didn't have four hours because that fire moves so fast, right? So developing evacuation plans in timelines for the worst case scenario for that place, right? How fast could a fire move here? 
Yeah. Um, I was wondering what kind of scale like we would ideally be implementing some of these solutions at. So like some of them is like, oh, like a mobile home park. So like there's obviously a, someone who owns that land. They would be responsible for that, whoever owns the land under those. But a lot of it seems like it would need to be at like the municipality or like at the state level, even like you're a small town that probably doesn't have the resources to do something like that. Or and then obviously the federal level too. What kind of, like how would you envision some of the stuff getting implemented? Yeah, so that's a great question uh, for a geographer. I love talking about scale, right? Um, because we have a tendency to do things at the scales that we've always done them at, right? So a lot of us that work in, um, it, you know, in remote sensing, uh, we do everything at 30 meter resolution. And any of you who have used land fire data, have you ever asked why land fire data is 30 meter resolution? Oh, it's because it's from Landsat, right? So 50 years of Landsat data means that our entire world is about 30 meter resolution. Um, social solutions have to be implemented at the scale appropriate to the community and to the solution, right? So it has to be scalable and it has to be essentially applied in a framework that you're able to identify the appropriate scale, right? And you're able to implement it and fund it at the appropriate scale, which is it's never gonna be a one size fits all, right? Just like people wish there was a silver bullet solution that this will fix our fire problem. Yeah. Spoiler alert, there's not, right? Um, there's not a single scale that we can apply these things at. We have to look at each community. And that's what things like CWPPs are supposed to do. Um, and they do in a lot of cases, right? We've got different scales of community wildfire protection plans. We need to keep thinking about broader sets of solutions that way too. I thought the mobile uh, park example was fascinating. And uh, have there been examples of these mobile park communities coming together and doing defensible space around the community or doing fields management? And like, do you know like who owns um, that land that's right next to it? So um, in general, mobile home uh, communities tend to be lower income residents, right? Uh, not just seniors also. And I say this with absolute authority because I grew up in a double wide. Um, and they the land is owned by a private landowner. The city of Nevada example is actually really unique because the land is owned by the city. The vast majority of mobile home parks are owned by a private landowner, right? But it's a commercial enterprise, which means it's also regulated. Um, and, you know, if the municipalities undertook to require uh, mobile homeowners to leave a buffer around the edge. Don't pack mobile homes in like sardines right up against Chaparral, right? Oh, we can require mobile home parks to have a buffer around the edge, right? We can require a landowner to do things within the mobile home park in common spaces, things like that, right? That can be regulated. Uh, and, you know, they're just, hasn't been a, a lot of uh, will, political willpower to do that type of thing. Um, and it's been to the detriment of a lot of people's lives. Okay. I have a second one. Okay. Uh, so when you were talking about the elderly folk not being able to do defensible space, do they have, like, are there alternative options? Like, are there businesses or contracting? that they can do and that people are doing? Is that widely used? Not yeah, widely. so um, there are a lot of companies out there, right? There's a lot of firms that have started up, uh, particularly in the last decade that we've seen this massive boom in California. We'll take care of your defensible space for you, right? It's a great small business thing, particularly for like landscapers um, who can do this as a secondary stream of income, right? They've got all the tools, they can do all the things. Um, and so that is increasing, right? And so it works when you've got um, people who are uh, elderly or mobility limited is, is one of the key factors, right? Um, when they've got the financial resources to hire those private companies themselves. Um, what we don't have in most places is either a public program. So Montecito, the example I showed, um, they applied for grants, right? And funded this public program where they would take these crews out to these people's homes and do the defensible space work on private property, right? And they figured that was a pretty good investment uh, because they knew if there was a wildfire, um, they would lose a lot more money on the back end. Uh, plus they might have fatalities to deal with, right? Um, and their philosophy uh, proved true in the 2017 Thomas fire because we had modeled 
Uh, we had modeled that under a worst case scenario, a fire like the Thomas fire would take out four to 500 homes uh, in Montecito. Uh, and they had done so much amazing work, defensible space, community field treatments. They had a neighborhood chipping program completely free for residents. Because one of the big problems when you clear defensible space is what do you do with all that vegetation, right? Oh, they had a neighborhood chipping program. Pull the stuff to the bottom of your driveway and we'll come along and chip it and take it away, right? So they had invested in all these programs. Um, over a 25 year period, Montecito spent about $2.2 million, all in grant money to do all these programs. Four to 500 houses in Montecito uh, is a high billions number, right? Uh, so yeah, they absolutely saved themselves a lot of money because their work was very, very effective in a worst case scenario fire, right? And they had zero fatalities in that area, um, despite it being a worst case scenario. Um, you know, so these are the types of programs that municipalities can do. Uh, the state can also do types of stuff that are making the most um, vulnerable residents, and particularly those that don't have a lot of extra income, right? Um, able to make their homes harden, for example. Um, he leads this great retreat in the summer, uh, and uh, we were up in Tahoe this summer on the Angora fire, um, and one of the things that all the fire agencies talked about was, well, yeah, you know, part of what worked really well in South Lake Tahoe is we have had this roof replacement program grants to replace your roof so that we don't have all these cedar-shaped roofs all over Tahoe, right? Because a lot of the people, I mean, if y'all have never had to replace your roof, it is expensive. Okay, um, and it's really expensive to put a fire resistant class A roof on. Um, and, you know, unless you got an extra 20 grand sitting around, right, a grant really helps to facilitate that. And it's for the good of the community because guess what? The fire didn't sweep through South Lake Tahoe and take out the whole town because those homes were resistant because of all sorts of things, right? But that's one of the types of programs that that region implemented to help facilitate that outcome. Oh, we have a question from the chat. Can sure. I that to you? Um, so this question um, is about defensible space in regards to small home communities like noble homes. So this yeah. person says, in their previous job, they worked in urban forestry, and one of the things they learned was about the heat island effect and how summer temperatures can be mitigated by shade trees. Yeah. So how can we reconcile that more people die from heat events, which happen mm -hmm. yearly, with the risk of wildfire, which is hit or miss, um, or uh, less predictable? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, and uh, so I now live in Fresno. I don't live in fire prone uh, Sonora anymore. Um, this, my husband thought our house was going to burn down. So it's perfect for a fire scientist. Um, so, so we live in, in Fresno, which, you know, it's, it's hot, like it's actually hotter than Davis in the summer because we don't get the breeze that comes in um, from uh, up the Delta uh, in the afternoons. Uh, and yeah, Shade is a huge thing there to mitigate that urban heat island effect, particularly in the most marginalized communities in town, right? Air conditioning or don't have air conditioning or it's really expensive to run the air conditioner with rising energy prices. Here's the fun part. What kind of trees do you think that a town in the Central Valley should be planting for shade? What makes sense? Not ambers. Right. So, so Fresno has an obsession with redwoods. They plant redwoods all over the city. I it boggles my mind. I'm like, I'm like, not only do these things require an enormous amount of water, which now with some of the drought conditions and hotter conditions, they're they're dying, right? Just leaving massive fuel loads all over the place. Um, conifers in general, much more flammable. Deciduous trees, they're not actually very flammable. Right, especially in midsummer when our peak heat is. So midsummer, our deciduous trees are at full leaf. They're going gangbusters. They're just not very flammable, right? Where you get flammability in deciduous forests, and let's be clear, they're still they're still uh, flammable. Where we generally get that flammability is in spring, in fall, on our shoulder seasons, when all those leaves that fall on the ground build up. Um, and then if they catch fire, you get this nice dinky little ground fire, right? That's what happens back east. Uh, but during peak season, when there's lots of photosynthesis happening in those deciduous trees, they don't generally burn. So that's a great option to address our urban heat island issue without introducing flammability into those systems, right? And we just need to get away from 
in my town's case, our obsession with redwoods, right? Or in other places in California, people plant ponderosa pines in the middle of the, the valley. Um, you know, they plant all sorts of things, junipers. Please don't plant junipers to try and create shade because they go off like Roman candles, right? <laughs> really high resin level, right? So, so tree selection can help address that problem. Was there a second one there too, or is that just a comment? Uh, like... Kind of follow up with the uh, more detail. Maybe folks can check out the chat later. <laughs> As rhinos, those get planted a lot. It's really scary. Davis and Sacramento love redwoods too. I mean, redwoods is best like Sacramento's got a ton of. Yeah, yeah the redwood grove with Davis is, oh, it looks bad. It's horrible. It looks, yeah. It's really awful. Yeah. Four trees. Yeah. <laughs> Other online questions or no? All good. Thank you all very much. Yeah,